Okay. Let's see. Any questions or comments about the reading? 13.8 trillion GSP. Really? Yeah. No, 16.8 trillion. That's the good. Yeah. 16, Six, that's the GDP? Yeah. yeah. Including manufacturing. Yeah. Okay. Good. I was wondering about that. Because partially we'll talk about the. Great Depression, but let's see where are we day to. Today, all right, day two, cool. All right, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about suffering. And um, how, it, how it applies to ethnic studies. But the Depression, you know, the old Cosby line, because when I wear sweaters, people say, oh, you look like it's the Cosby look. Yeah, well, okay, <laughs> Cosby's gangster, okay? Cosby bankrolled Malcolm X movie for Spike Lee. Cosby does a lot of things under the table that people don't know about. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with being smart and black. Rich is good, too, but smart, black, and rich. Hey, and educated. What's wrong with that? He went to Morehouse. And he went to Morehouse, <laughs> right. So, okay. Hey, so when America catches cold, black people get pneumonia. So, you know, the common cold and pneumonia are both viruses. So when I'm talking about memes, understand that those viruses are the mind that affect people's thinking and make them go off and say and think weird stuff. Okay, they may appear rational, but when they say stuff that's like clearly off, you gotta go, what are they thinking? And so just by what they say, you can begin to think, of, you can begin to understand what memes they're operating off. So, you know, I don't know if Dave Ralston is a Klansman, but when he says red-blooded American, I know where that phrase came from, whether he acknowledges it or not, or whether he thinks the, it's relevant or not. You know, yesterday in addictions class, we were ta I was talking about um, if you're being trained as a drug counselor, you're basically dealing with a medical science. So yeah, you might be a fundamentalist Christian, but guess what? You have to treat gay people not like they're crazy, not like it's a disease, but as it's a part of normal human sexual diversity, regardless of what your Bible says about them. Because, of course, since it's me, <laughs> I will also say, you know, your Bible said that black people were cursed. Your Bible said that um, not only black people were cursed, but we couldn't even marrow, marry each other heterosexually. That's why we had to jump the broom. Oh, and then once we can marry heterosexually, we can't go in the same church as you. Oh, now, now that we can go in the same church, now we can't, well, we couldn't marry white people or any outside of the race. And you said your Bible said that. Uh, well, is it the Bible saying it or your interpretation? And where are you getting that interpretation? Really? Black people are cursed because Noah's son saw Noah bathing? The curse of Ham, basically. Yeah, well, Tower of Babel is another thing within there as well. So, you know, if your interpretation of the Bible is off on so many other things that we've had to have civil rights struggle on, what else could it be off on as well? That's all I'm saying. You know, is it God's word? Because look, if you believe God is the creator of the universe and all-powerful, omnipotent, and all that kind of stuff, really, what does he need you to make holy war for? Yeah. Why does he make poor children suffer? There it's, is so that. Yeah. Well, there's another, there's another piece. I don't think it's not him making folks suffer, but we'll talk about that, too. <clears throat> Though I have had cause to question why do bad things happen to good people? All right, so back in the days that we're talking about in the 20s, so white employers maintain blacks only fit for dirty, unpleasant, low-paying, and heavy work. 
basically like slavery. So for example, we don't have a foundry in our plant, and that is the work that Negroes are best suited for. Now, of course, not having the historical context of what foundry means in Polish ghetto, right? So, oh, well, we don't have a foundry, so therefore, you know, we don't have work that black can do. Like, not that, so it doesn't occur to them blacks could actually be the managers of your foundry, whatever. So, ghetto. So Milwaukee, we just sort of work like a family here and to bring in Negro workers would cause confusion and cause white workers to feel that their jobs had lost in dignity of being done by Negroes, which, okay, this is again a 20th century meme that persisted since the early 19th century, the early 1800s and even 1600s where uh, under Jeffersonian racial rules, basically black people didn't want to work, or white people didn't want to work side by side with blacks even though they were free blacks. And then, you know, pitting each other against each other to compete for the job that we're capable of doing. So this is why, you know, in terms of looking at what, what makes you economically viable? Are you being trained to be a good employee or are you being trained to start your own business? Which is that? Which, which should you be doing? All right, so for example, y'all like your weekends? Y'all like minimum wage? Y'all like jobs with benefits? Those are all things with unions Right? I'm in a unionized environment. I'm getting paid more than a full professor at the University of Oregon. I'm actually getting paid more than many managers at the University of Oregon because we have a unionized environment. Right? That basically agitates your wages and benefits. So, 24 unions affiliated with the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, barred blacks entirely. Which is why, because we often had separate unions or separate professional organizations in parallel with the white ones. I may or may not have mentioned, for example, um, my father's part of the NMA, which used to be the, back in the day, the Negro Medical Association, but it's national. And it allowed, you know, so because he, there was a time when, as a psychiatrist, he could not join the American Psychological Association or the American Medical Association, even though he was a doctor, because they barred blacks from it. And there was, there's still an issue today, and some of our students face this, where they might be nursing students uh, interning at Riverbend or local clinics, and there are white people that don't want to have people of color touch them today. So that's not just a news item that happened somewhere else where the white supremacist didn't want black nurse attending his newborn baby that was in ICU. Like, okay, well, why don't you go to the Klan hospital? <laughs> but, because the Klan doesn't have a hospital. <laughs> All right, so blacks. Back in those days, politically black, still black, Republic, black Republicans, that is because of the party of Lincoln, So Republicans then, and somewhat now, did little for blacks. Democrats were not much better. So FDR, for example, supported segregation during World War II. Democrats rejected the NAACP proposal for civil rights plank, uh, calling for an end to racial discrimination. This is in the 40s, during the war, which we'll get to. FDR felt he needed Southern segregationists to pass needed legislation for the country. Of course, that doesn't mean civil rights legislation. Okay? But with the growing influence of the black vote, he began to shift and with some needed pushes. Now, we see this pattern being repeated with the Republicans today. After having getting trounced so bad. Oh, well, maybe we should feature more prominent Hispanics. Maybe we should soften some of our positions. Maybe we should do this, that, and the other. All right, so when we talk about developing emerging tactics, actions, 
We have to look at the thought processes behind them and who develops them and where they're coming from. So, this question still comes with how do you deal with violent racist America nonviolently? Now, I'm a firm believer in self defense. I have to agree with Malcolm that self defense is not violence, it's intelligence. However, I can recognize that nonviolence is a superior spiritual path. I can see that. But I'm not going to allow a genocidal racist to, or rapist to come after me. I will defend those who cannot defend themselves. That's just how I'm constructed, right? So we talked about, I was using the Star Wars analogy before, Gormo meets Yoda. Uh, in, fr in the 1930s, Howard Thurman, his wife Sue, and Edward G. Carroll mate for three hours with Mahatma Gandhi near Bardoli, India. And Gandhi said, it may be through the Negroes that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. And I just wanted to give you a context of Martin Luther King is seven at this time, right? So he's kind of like out of the picture. When Arun Gandhi came here, Gandhi's grandson, I asked him, wait, Actually, I, I was going to ask him, what, um, do you remember this group of black civil rights leaders coming to see your grandfather? But then I did the math. Oh, you're two. Yeah. <laughs> Martin Luther King is seven. You're two. All right. <laughs> Forget that question. I didn't ask you that. Said, okay, so... What do, you, what do you think about that? Because one of the things he had commented on, and you know, some BSU members you know, rightly questioned some of his comments that were made earlier in 1904, where he used the word kafir, which kafir is basically the, South, the, the Afrikaans version of nigger, right? Well, South African. South yeah, African. yeah, kafir. kafir. So yeah, if you go to a Thai restaurant and you see kafir lime, that probably I've never is. seen it in the movie. The Weapon movie. Yeah. South Africa. Right. right. Says that. Right. It's like, what is that? Right. And it's also in the Gandhi movie, too. Cafe Lafa, as then you said. Lafa. Yeah. Kaffir. 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 Yeah. All right. So, part of what happened in, what was happening in South Africa and worse what was happening in South Africa is that different races were being pitted against each other, right? So, whites get beat up. In their configuration, you have blacks, you have colored people, which includes not only black and white mixes, but also Asians. And then you have whites, right? So, whites would beat up Indians, this is the dot, Indians, right? Because they're there because it's a British colony, former British colony. So, the whites are beating up the Indians because they're not white enough, and the blacks are beating up the Indians because they're not black enough, right? So they're getting it from both sides, and so, yeah, if you're, going to, if you're getting beat up by everybody, what are your feelings <laughs> going to be about that in 1904, right? And of course you're going to say, you know, use the dominant epithet against people that you're mad about, right? I'm not excusing it, it's just predictable, right? So part of the piece that goes along with that, so understanding that Poverty is violence, then one of poverty's relatives is ignorance. All right, now we'll talk about net worth in a little while, but net worth is usually talking about financial, it's a financial literacy term, but that's from a view of economy that only looks as, thing, looks as money as things of value and not like wisdom, not looking at, for example, the wisdom of understanding that poverty isn't happening by accident, it's happening by design. Okay, it's not random. Right? And ignorance is also not happening randomly, it's also by design. So you have to understand how that works. So, Gandhi's Gormo, Martin Luther King courses Obi-Wan Kenobi, 
A. Philip Randolph is Mace Windu, which unless, of course, you've seen the first two movies, you don't know who that is. But A. Philip Randolph also met, went to India with Gandhi. And A. Philip Randolph is the person that basically organizes the first March on Washington, which we'll get to in another decade, like next week. Um, and so, and, and was also instrumental in the second March in Washington, which you more, more familiarly know about. So I'm just going to give him a Jedi Master that's badass, too. Baird Rustin, Qui-Gon Jinn, Howard Yerman Thoda, Yoda, and Yoda's teacher is Gandhi. So the hidden teacher behind a particular lineage. So now you've seen this already, so I'm going to actually take it apart from rather perspective and go deeper into who Howard was, because most people have never heard of him. And uh, his teachings and his books are instructive. So he's writing from a Christian perspective that the reason you're nonviolent is that if you kill your opponent, you forever remove the possibility that your opponent will achieve liberation in this lifetime. Which if, you know, I'm not sure how you get that from a King James version of the Bible, unless you're doing Midrash. Or was it Jidrash? Closer to Midrash. There's no word for it in English. So, I'll explain. Arabic and Hebrew. The Hebrew were a particular tribe and that was their language. These are two of the four Semitic languages. So there's like sister languages. So in Arabic, there's Jidrash. And Hebrew, there is Midrash. And they both basically mean, mean the same thing. Because in both languages, a single word can have up to 10 different translations. Multiple meanings. You interpret scripture by all those meanings simultaneously. You cool? You chill? That was cold. That's a cold jam. That's cold duck. My ex did me cold. I'm not chill with that. Right? Same word, multiple meanings. And you shouldn't have to ask what I mean by it. You should know already, right? Midjidrash and Midrash, basically, that's where we get that. Because this is us <laughs> doing that. All right? So if you understand that both Yeshua and Gautama Buddha probably were operating off of the same basis in terms of looking at the, what we refer to as the... Um, Egyptian mystery schools, where you basically, in order to understand your oppression, if you are oppressed, you have to understand how you are being oppressed, and that is one of the keys to freedom. Okay, life is suffering. Buddha's not having a bad day. This is a fact. Life is suffering. So understanding how you are suffering, the source of your suffering, is the key to liberation. So... This is a Christian statement coming from an interpretation in the King James Version of the Bible, because that's what he's working on. It says, the reason you're nonviolent is if you kill your opponent, your opponent never achieves liberation in this lifetime. So this is basically early liberation theology without necessarily overtly naming that. So, suffering. <clears throat> I got this from Wikipedia, but just so you know that this is um, available stuff, and his books are available. So he's born in uh, 1899 in Florida, dean of theology at, cha at the chapels of Howard University and Boston University for more than two decades, wrote 20 books, and in 44 helped found the first racially integrated multicultural church in the United States. So understand what was happening on Sunday, just like in the 50s with the Civil Rights Movement when Martin observed that Sunday is the most segregated time in America. 
All right. Where was that? Well, that was being driven by a certain, certain interpretations of the King James Version of the Bible that said, well, God made the races separate, so it's God will that the whites be superior, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, you know, you should always be suspicious when your religion or your holy books put you on top. You should question that. So in 23, he graduated from Morehouse. He was a Morehouse man as valedictorian, ordained as a minister two years later. And he pursued further studies as a special student of philosophy at Haverford College with Rufus Jones, a noted Quaker philosopher and mystic, where he earned his doctorate. Selected as dean at Rankin College at Rankin Chapel at Howard, in D.C. in 1932, served there for a number of years, traveled broadly, heading Christian missions and meeting with world figures such as Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. When Thurman asked Gandhi what message he should take back to the United States, Gandhi said he regretted not having made nonviolence more visible as a practice worldwide and suggested some American black men would succeed where he had failed. You've seen that quote, the quote that I reeled a couple of slides back. He left his position at Howard. Howard left his position at Howard to help the Fellowship of Re Recon Reconciliation establish a church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco. Now, for Fellowship of Re Reconciliation is uh, a multi—well, it's a multi—not disciplinary. What's the term? Um, ecumenical group. Uh, a lot of Quakers. Uh, within the peace movement. It's for the Fellowship of Recon uh, Reconciliation that um, Bayard Rustin was a member of that when he contacted Martin Luther King. And we'll get to that whole 50s thing mm, early next term. But it was the idea that Howard had actually met Gandhi. Bayard Rustin was a student of Howard's and a compatriot of Howard's who basically brought that whole nonviolent mission and uh, tactic to Martin Luther King, because when Martin Luther King's house had gotten bombed, he basically sat up with a gun and a shotgun and you know, waited for them to come back. And Bayard said, look, you, co they, you come at them with guns, they outnumber you, they'll wipe you out. So this is during the Montgomery bus boycott. So you should meet Howard. And it turns out that Martin Luther King Sr., and Howard Thurman were friends. <coughs> so he was also able to tutor his friend's son, and he also became friends in his own right. right. So Dr. Thurman was invited to Boston, where he became the first black dean of Marsh Chapel, first black to be named tenure dean at a chapel at a majority white university. wrote lots of books, 20 books of ethical and cultural criticism, <coughs> most famous of his works, depending on who you believe, Jesus and the Disinherited, um, which deeply influenced Martin Luther King and other leaders, both black and white, of the modern civil rights movement. So Thurman, as, as I said before, is a classmate and friend of King's father at Morehouse. King visited, King Jr. visited Thurman while he's at Boston University, where Martin got his master's. And Herman, Thurman, in turn, mentored his former classmate's son and his friend. Served as spiritual advisor to King, Sherwood Eddy, James Farmer, A.J. Musty, and uh, Polly Murray, among others. So jumping to the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path that Gautama Buddha articulated. So the Four Noble Truths, the first one, life means suffering. The or origin of suffering is attachment. The cessation of suffering is attainable, and the path to liberation is the cessation of suffering. Cessation of suffering is the path of liberation. So life is suffering. Origin of suffering is attachment. Part of the attachment is occurring mostly in your mind, which basically attaches itself uh, to sense phenomena. And so through the, the, the technique of, uh, among other things, through yoga or actually meditation, 
you begin to discern the way to be less attached to, for example, your anger. So for example, forgiveness is not forgetting your anger. Forgiveness is letting go of your attachment to anger. So the Eightfold Path of Wisdom. First, right view, that is seeing things in a non-dualistic way, right intention, ethical conduct, right speech, right action, right livelihood, and mental development, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Right meaning effective. So, and there, uh, there's actually more to all of this. But, you know, when I said Howard, from a Christian point of view, basically speaking from a point of view that's almost Buddhist, not saying that Buddhism is necessarily deeper than Christianity, but it is older. So part of making a reference like that is to, sh to begin to show you, at least on a surface level, what that could be looking at. So you live in such a way so that you don't create more attachment for yourself and more suffering for others. And this comes in line with um, what Gandhi is talking about with Satyagraha. You don't inflict suffering on those who are attacking you, they're attacking you because of their attachment to ignorance. So you teach them. And so what you're inflicting on yourself is the suffering, suffering not letting them beat you up, but the suffering where you are having to wrestle with your own impatience and teaching them, because that can often be difficult. So you gently and persistently Continue teaching them. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can you go back? Yeah. For number three and number four, um, having four. Which one? Um, the four from the four. Okay. Yeah. I'm having a hard time understanding what it means. Okay. So, for example, With the first truth, so life is suffering. The origin of suffering is attachment. So part of understanding what the attachment is, is one, noticing that you are attached, and then also why you are attached. That's what's making you suffer. Suffer is your attachment. So <coughs> it is possible to end that suffering. And that's attainable in this lifetime. Then the path to the cessation of suffering is the path of liberation. I misread cessation. Yeah, that's I right. Sensation. Yeah, yeah. It's cessation, but sensation is. Look, you're still having senses. Sensation of suffering. Yeah. D'accord. Say. Okay, in French. Okay. Hey, you got to translate. I want to know what you're talking about, too. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, suffering. So, this is directly Howard Thurman. So, Howard wrote a book, one of my favorite books of his, called Disciplines of the Spirit. And one of the disciplines of the Spirit is suffering. So, there's an entire chapter on this. Uh, I'm quoting from it. Suffering is a form of physical pain. The more developed the sense of self and the more acute the self-awareness, the more definite is the potential for suffering. Okay? So, the more consciousness you have... See, Buddha don't tell you that. He's not hiding anything. He said, life is suffering. He said that straight up. Okay? And the path to liberation is attainable. 
Okay? But as your consciousness grows, the more suffering you are conscious of. This is what Howard is saying. Okay? Suffering is a form of physical pain, but it's not just physical pain. The more developed the sense of self and the more acute the self-awareness, the more definite is the potential for suffering. The greater the consciousness of the being, the greater the potential for suffering. But deny the presence of human consciousness, then you open the door to inflicting suffering on non-humans and humans you consider subhuman. As a kid, we used to stage, uh, I won't say we, I did it. 100 ants against a spider in a jar. Right? Insect fights, bug fights. We thought nothing of stepping on creatures or, you know, I didn't get to the level of torturing cats or whatever. It was like mostly insects, right? Or dropping things in spiders' web to see what the spider would do and all that. So, yeah, I'm not tripping on the suffering of, of a fly or whatever. I couldn't relate to them. Didn't have to worry about their consciousness. No, I didn't pull wings off them or anything like that, though there was a stage in which, you know, I considered doing that. Didn't care about the suffering of their insects, right? Things that are higher up, i.e. the food chain, we're concerned about. Oh, well, I'm a, mostly a vegetarian, but... Uh, was the critter killed humanely? Was it halal? Was it kosher? Kosher beef. Both Jews and Muslims don't eat pork, so there ain't no kosher, kosher pork. But how was the critter killed? Was it killed humanely? Well, there are, the vegetarians would argue, uh, they're, you're killing it. That ain't humane. Lots of folks take different views, right? So, suffering. Greater the consciousness of the being, the greater the potential for suffering. But deny the presence of human consciousness, then you open the door to inflicting suffering on non-humans, and humans you consider subhuman. For example, so Howard was born in 1899, so the incident he relates in this chapter, at age 13, of a little girl first scattering the pile of leaves. So he's basically doing an odd job for this white guy and his white family, basically sweeping leaves and gathering them into a pile and the little girl kept, kept scattering the pile as he put it together, right? So he's black, she's white, she's the daughter of his employer, there's a limit to how far <laughs> you can go with that, you can't whack her because you'll get lynched. If you say, if you look at her funny, you can get lynched. So he, he tells her, look, I'll, I'm going to tell your daddy, right? And she runs in the house and gets a pin and comes sticking with it. Sticking with it. And he goes, ow. And she, go, and she says, that didn't hurt you really. You can't feel. Now, in 1912, this is actually a scientifically held belief promoted by white scientists who held that non-whites being subhuman could not feel pain the way whites could, and so operated on them without anesthesia, not only particularly in German-held German Africa, but also America, too. And this is a subject in the book, Medical Apartheid, which if you have uh, girlfriends or female relatives that go for gynecological exams, um, get pap smears, the speculum was created by um, this white doctor who made speculums out of pewter spoons and operated on slave women without anesthesia because they didn't feel pain because they're not human. So when Howard is talking about, look, the African American experience is basically where we regularly have to deal with fairly horrific stuff without reacting to it. Not that we don't react to it, but we're not necessarily allowed to react to it overtly. We're not. Because at some point the protest could mean that you could get killed. 
So that means it's a form of suffering. And Howard's talking about, okay, yo, my people. <laughs> and not just my people. Suffering exists. And because of our level of suffering, this might make us angry, this might make us want to strike out. Can't do that. Though you might want to. You might want to be subtle about how you inflict violence. Yes or no. So, scientifically held belief. Therefore, promoted socially. So. How long was that a belief for? Are you going to get to that? <laughs> Well, scientifically, the dictionary would say that it's discredited. Okay? They would say that it was discredited uh, somewhere around the 50s and 60s. Right. However, all right. Discredited like the clan in 24? Differently. Oh, okay. <laughs> now that's more, of, that's more of ignoring the evidence. All right? So that's why the reason I, you know, the answer put to, I'm not dodging the question. I'm just saying, look, this came up in my office earlier. So... The people we call develop mentally challenged, disabled. What's a common pejorative term for them? Retard. Retard. Okay. All right. Okay. That is slow. Whatever. Whatever. Right? Okay? So, where that came from? Freud, such people were referred to as idiots, because Freud, in his construction of the human psyche, you have your id, which is your base impulses, your ego, and your superego, right? Which is societal programming, and your ego basically says, "Don't you know? Put the lid, put the lid up when you pee, and put the lid down. Okay, don't pee in the shrubbery. You're not a dog, or all men could be dogs, but we won't go into that. So." An id, these base impulses, okay, which might cause you to do things that are not socially acceptable, which might include, if you've ever worked with these populations, right, might include masturbation in public, right? They feel the impulse, they do it, right? Because for whatever reasons, the other parts of mind that would put brakes on it aren't present. Now, Sir Robert Downs, do you remember this? This came up earlier. Sir Robert Downs, remember we used to refer to these folks as what? Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Mongoloid. Mongoloid, right? Mongoloid. Okay, mongoloid idiots, right? The idea, mongoloid coming from that theory, Blumenbach's theory of racial superiority. Caucasoids were superior, mongoloids were devolved, negroids devolved from the mongoloids. All right, and so what you do with these folks is that you sterilize them, they don't feel pain, they're not like the rest of us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Another meme that's basically, again, they're subhuman. Right? So, Howard talks about in the, in, 
So the mind of man, the mind may work out an immunity so that the spirit of the person not only remains undefeated, but is triumphant over his suffering. By mind, the total sense of being, the comprehensive focal unity of the man's personality, the isness of personality. It is the central consciousness ground of personal being that is at last confronted by suffering and in that ultimate private encounter, the battle is won or lost. Handle your suffering or be handled by it. So, when Buddha is talking about how you relate to suffering, you actually have to look at your suffering from a place that, me that means that you're not in the middle of it. You're looking at it as if it's outside of you while you're in the middle of it. Like it's not so much happening to somebody else, but you can relate to it and say, okay, Huh, I see the structure of where that attachment is causing me pain and I can cut that attachment and now watch it happen as if it's happening to someone else. Or I can put myself in somebody else's shoes without necessarily being in the middle of their suffering. Okay, as an example, I have to treat racists. Did I tell you the Thor's hammer wolf's head story? Oh, well, I can't, I can't discriminate against people because of their political beliefs. Can't, right? So, a guy comes in calling himself Bjorn. Now, that ain't the name on his driver's license or a student ID. <laughs> But okay, fine. And he's wearing a Thor's hammer wolf head. I go, okay, Thor's hammer. You're an Odinist, particularly pre-Christian religion, right? Pagan, as from the point of view of Christians, right? And it's actually well done. It's a Thor's hammer. It's upside down, but it's in the form of a wolf's head. Oh, well, that's very clever. I said, nice Thor's hammer wolf's head. He goes, you know what this is? I go, yeah, I know what it is. You do time? How do you... Never mind how I know that. Yeah, where'd you do time? Texas. Okay, so you had to join... You know, I assume you couldn't join the Mexican Mafia or, you know, the Nation of Islam. So you had to go, join a gang to survive in Texas, right? So you're either AB or Aryan Brotherhood or EK or something like that. He nods, yes. Hence, the Thor's hammer wolf head. You're an Odinist. Okay? So, he's shaking. He's been referred to me by student health because he's kind of reeking of alcohol and he's basically detoxed and he tells me this story. He's cold, so I'm offering him green tea and echinacea. Wrote this up as a story. Green tea with skinhead. So I say, um, well, so tell me what happened. How'd you come to us? And so he woke up th that morning. He's homeless. Woke up with um, his pants down by his ankles after drinking 540s. Drinking 540s with his former cellmates and jailhouse skinhead friends. And they gang raped him when he got drunk and left him under a porch at Whitaker in the rain. So, your skinhead homies raped you, and now you're shaking, which means you might be seizing up from withdrawing from alcohol. I need to get you into Buckley House. So I said, I need to tell you the straight joke, okay? So obviously I know that, you know, I've dealt with gangs before. I've dealt with you know, supremacists before. You don't scare me or intimidate me. The only thing that I'm afraid of is that you might not listen to me because of my excellent suntan. Ha ha ha. Right? You got it. Use humor. Okay, so here's the thing. I can take you to Buckley House. I can call them, get, you know, get you in, because I don't like this shaking thing, and we don't want you to drink. So in 40 days, and this is the hard part, 
In 40 days, you're going to have to get an AIDS test. <coughs> okay, this is standard medical procedure. Sorry to tell you this, and sorry that your first conversation with a black person has to be on this life or death level. Okay, but I ain't scared of you, but I got to tell you this the straight life and death stuff. Now, I don't have to believe, well, I don't, as you know, I don't believe in white supremacy. But I have to understand his mind to say, okay, can you hear this truth from me in my excellent suntan? Maybe, maybe not. I could see how he might have to adopt certain mindsets to survive inside of a prison. But you ain't inside of a prison and it's your skinhead homies that raped you. And I understand the morning after you are now trying to wrap your mind around this ultimate cruelty that they paid in you and the kindness that is coming from a person that you have been conditioned to think of as your enemy. I mean, we're talking like that. He's just kind of like, he's just kind of like nodding. So just marinate on that. Let me call Buckley House, see if there's a bed for you. And, and all I could come up with is, are there any Jews there? Wow. So I lied. Because Bob's Jewish. And Bob was the head of Buckley at the time. Now he's head of Willamette Family. And I was just hoping that Bob wasn't wearing Star David. Because, no, I need to get you into treatment. You don't need to be tripping about whether there's Jews there. And you're probably not even going to see Bob till way later anyway. So, all right? But I can understand why he's scared. <laughs> scared of me? Scared of Jews? No. It's your skin. Jews or blacks didn't rape you? Why are you tripping? Well, I understand why you're tripping, right? He, that was suffering. That was a relief from his suffering. He's in a worldview where he thinks minorities are committing genocide against white people. Look, white people have been around for 22,000 years. We ain't been trying to wipe them out. We don't have to trip. We're already the majority, always have been. We're not trying to wipe you out. Just try and keep us, everybody, from wiping everybody else out, all right? So when Howard is talking, go back to slide if you would. All right, so the immunity. The mind may work out an immunity so the spirit of the person not only remains undefeated but is triumphant over his suffering. You know that racism has wounded me. And us. Because it takes just as much to be oppressed as be, be the oppressor. And... We all have been attacked on different levels from, for various levels, for various characteristics, right? So when he's talking about, just like the Buddha is talking about, you have to discern these differences and these connections from a place where they don't touch you because the real you is unaffected by this. And you have to get in touch with that. But if the person comes to grip with his suffering by bringing to bear upon it all the powers of his mind and spirit, he moves at once into a vast but solitary arena. It is here that he faces the authentic adversary himself. He looks into the depths of the abyss of life and raises the ultimate question about the meaning <coughs> of existence. He comes face to face with whatever is his conception of ultimate authority is God. The first thing his reflection brings to mind is that there is a fellowship of suffering as, a well, as well as a community of sufferers. Okay, that talks about how do we get out of this? These are your people. The people have gone through the same experiences that you have. So the bottom line, the meaning of existence. Um, the last words on the cross... Eli, Eli, Lachmana Shabakthani, which in Aramaic means, for this I was kept, this is my destiny. 
Not Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Where do they come up with this crap? Please. He was a master. Didn't cry out at all when they were beating the crap out of him. Didn't cry out when he's getting nailed to the cross. Like, you think he's going to go out like a wimp? No. I ain't buying that. Nice try. For this I was kept. This is my destiny. If the pain is great enough to lay siege to life and threaten it with destruction, a demand is made upon all one's resources. <coughs> In this kind of concentration of spirit, the energy of life becomes available when the conditions of single-mindedness are met. Now, when often within meditation practice we talk about becoming one-pointed, Yeshua actually makes reference to this in Matthew. The, eye of the, the light of the body is in the eye. Therefore, if your eye is single, your body is full of light. That only makes sense from a yogic framework. Third eye point. Concentrate. One pointed. Your eye is single, your body is full of light. So often we see people as profoundly changed by their suffering. Into their faces comes a subtle radiance and a settled serenity into their relationships a vital generosity that opens the sealed doors of the heart in all who are encountered along the way. So he's actually talking about within this context and I've kind of edited out the, the negative part but I'll share it with you now. Your reaction to suffering causes you, because he talked about in the previous slide, about you're confronted with God. Whatever your version of it is. And you might either shake your fist at heaven, why are you doing this to me, and become bitter, or it transforms you. One of two things. You become bitter, or it transforms you. Now, in order for it to transform you, you have to not be the one that's destroyed. <coughs> 